believe it or not, there is crossover between the PTSD and the autism. Uh, kids with autism are suffering social anxiety, the communication challenges, and um, the isolation for different reasons, but the needs are the same. So um, the crossover pieces for the program are the visits, the overs, the, um, the nudges, the grounding behaviors to keep people in reality and keep them focused and, and re refocusing their energy on something positive. Where the PTSD program was um, diverging from the autism program was in the nightmare interruption, in um, what we called in the early days, our blocking behaviors of positional cues where the dog could create for the PTSD handler, um, could create a bigger bubble um, to create more personal space and um, nightmare interruption and things like that were um, add-ons to what we were already doing with the autism dogs. So in light of all that good learning that went on in 2010, um, we started embarking on a program to, to do PTSD dogs for the first responder and veterans community. Um, at the same time we made that decision, we also started, you know, educating our team about mental health and um, trauma and all the things that we would need to do and need to know to deliver on our program. One of the early decisions that we made for the program was to have somebody with a mental health background on staff. And um, what was happening south of the border is they were utilizing um, mental health professionals on an ad hoc basis, but they weren't actually hiring people onto their staff way back in the day. And we were one of the first ADI programs to have mental health professionals and uh, social workers on staff to help us transition from what we were doing with autism in a more into a more mental health related workspace and trauma informed and um, trauma, not informed so much, but trauma aware, uh, we're working towards becoming trauma informed. So with all of this great stuff at the beginning, we've developed the program over the years and um, we're thrilled to have been able to place more than 40 dogs out through this program. Um, although COVID has slowed us down, we're excited to get started for next year and to dive in and get back on track with our numbers and get some of the backlog cleared up. Um, because the program's been running, our first dog went out in 2011. Uh, because the program's been running for a decade, as you can imagine, we have dogs that are coming um, up for retirement and replacement. And as with the autism program, um, not everybody wants a replacement dog when their dogs retire. Uh, some people do, and we look at each uh, family's needs on an individual basis, and those decisions are made on an individual basis. Um, but in large part, the dogs, as with the autism program, stay with the families through retirement. And if for some reason that doesn't happen, then the dogs can always come back to us and um, we will rehome them. We've had a few cases where um, in the, on the odd occasion where the dogs have come back, they've ended up back with the puppy raisers after <laughs> after an eight year working life. So um, yeah, so as we sit here tonight, we have two gentlemen that have, um, have very different experiences. Lawrence uh, is a military veteran. Uh, Jim was military and first responder. You used with, uh, was it RCMP, Jim? Police? You're on mute. I, I'm <laughs> sorry, I, I gave that drastic response. It's a uh, inter force rivalry thing. No, yeah, uh, o OPP. OPP. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Jim, um, Jim was actually one of our first dual uh, first responder and veteran to get one of our dogs way back in the day. And um, as you can imagine, since 2011, when we first placed our dogs, the program has evolved substantially. We've gotten better at understanding PTSD. We've gotten better at understanding our clients. And um, we are proud to, uh, through the program, be working with um, partners like Wounded Warriors Canada, who is a major funder for this program. And in addition to providing funding for our service dogs, 
they're committed to uh, providing um, support services for families of veterans and first responders. They provide trauma-informed training with uh, mental health professionals. They take a very holistic approach to their programs. And in addition, like I said, to the funding for our teams have provided NSD with um, access to training modules and um, information sharing across the spectrum for service dog providers for uh, veterans and first responders across Canada. Um, so that's a bit of a back uh, kind of story of how we got going uh, with the program and why it came about. Um, as with our autism program, we were the, we were the first program, uh, ADI accredited program in Canada to take up the PTSD service dogs. Uh, we're now one of several. We work collaboratively with the other PTSD service dog providers uh, across Canada. And um, we are really well represented um, here in North America when it comes to our PTSD service dogs. Um, the dogs these days, the work that they're doing has evolved. Um, to give you an idea of what some of the skills look like, we talked about the visits and the overs being similar to autism. So we have, we have light and deep pressure. Uh, we do nudges and those are disruptive cues so that um, individuals, if they are uh, under high level of stress or anxiety, start to dissociate. Um, we can have the dogs uh, cue into stress cues. Uh, stress cues are um, individualized to the client. Uh, some folks, you know, they tap their, they tap their, their toes or um, fiddle with their hands. Or um, we have a couple of guys that are a little bit shy of hair on top. They rub their head. So whatever their stress cues um, are, we uh, would custom train the dogs to respond to those stressors and come up and nudge or put their head in their lap to to try and redirect them to a, a, a more positive energy. Um, we've had some clients who have utilized the dog to help them with um, just managing their own anxiety in, by mirroring the behavior of the dog, uh, whether it's putting your hand on the dog and trying to match your breathing, breathing with the dog's breathing and calming yourself down and being able to relax. Um, the dogs do help with hypervigilance. Um, and as I said earlier, they can be positioned around the handler to, to allow them for a larger personal space bubble so that um, they have a little bit more um, space around them just to feel more comfortable out in public and the dogs will come out in front or in behind or down the side, whatever that positioning happens to be. Um, nightmare interruption is, um, again, trained as needed for clients. Not everybody wants or needs nightmare interruption. Um, we've had clients that, um, who didn't think they needed nightmare interruption until they got the dog home and the dog was alerting to nightmares they didn't even realize they were having. So um, it uh, is all very individualized training. That's one of the key differences uh, with the autism, the PTA. SD dogs are highly specialized to the needs. Um, Andrea can talk about this later, Lawrence's wife, but we do rely on our, our clients uh, circles of support to gather that information so we can customize the dogs as best we can before they go out to the client. Um, nightmare interruption can take many shapes and forms. The, um, depending on the nature of the nightmares and how our clients move through those, uh, we can train the dogs to pull the blankets down from the bed to, to jar them awake. It's not always safe for the dogs. One of the things we learned coming out of the feedback we got from the programs in the US in the early days was it's not always safe for the dogs to get up on the bed with folks that are, are in the middle of a night terror. And uh, a safer way to go is to have the dogs pull the covers off. So we have blanket, they're called blanket poles, little tabs that you can clip to the blankets and the dogs can tug on those and wake the person up that way. For folks that uh, don't have violent nightmares or night terrors, uh, a common is just having the dog come up and nudge 
them um, from the side of the bed or jump up on the bed if you're not already sleeping up there and physically nudging them and waking them up. And of course, then they have the dogs there to, to manage whatever anxiety in order to, to get back to a calm state of mind. Um, that's a general overview of some of the work the dogs are doing and how it's done. As I said, every client's a little bit different. There are two clients that are here today. How they utilize their dog now compared to when they first got them is different, I'm sure, and what skills they need and use on a regular basis with the dog changes over time as well and is different between families. But um, we're grateful for everybody who's uh, zoomed in today, um, a chance to understand what goes on with their dogs. And um, as we found out the hard way locally this, this week, this past week is that invisible disabilities like autism and PTSD are not always understood when people are out in the community. So, um, Opportunities to talk to folks who are actually utilizing our dogs and out in the community can help educate people about awareness and um, hopefully create a safer space for folks when they're actually out there with their dogs. And that's all I got for now. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Danny. I'm gonna pass it over to Jim, uh, let him take the floor and tell everyone what his experience was like. Um, Jim, it's all yours. Okay. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Danny, first of all, for inviting me to do this. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but as the meeting was drawing closer and the anxiety level was raised, it was like, geez, why do I say yes to these things all the time? <laughs> but anyways, I say yes because uh, because of how my life has been so radically altered um, for the better, uh, thanks to Vitus and, and to National Service Dogs. So uh, secondly, uh, I also want to thank uh, each and every one of you, as I understand you volunteers, and I've said it before, I'm gonna get emotional, and that's the way I am. I don't apologize for it anymore. Um, you're angels, you are angels. And uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, I'm 66 years young. And uh, I first entered the world of policing in the military in 1977. Um, and I, I spent nine years in the military. Um, and then I decided if I was going to do policing, I might as well get paid for it. <laughs> so. Uh, because at that time in the military, we certainly weren't making a, a big dollar. And, uh, and, I, and I wanted to, uh, I still wanted to have hands-on policing and I was still young enough to, uh, to do that transition. So I joined the OPP in, in 1986. And uh, uh, I was only in uniform for a couple of years because of my, my uh, previous military uh, background. Um, I quickly moved down to the Windsor area and, um, and got on the drug squad and, uh, and worked the intelligence unit for 12 years, which is proof you don't have to have it to work it. <laughs> but I did that for a dozen years, uh, worked undercover and plain clothes duties. Um, and then in, uh, in 2000, I promoted and uh, went back to uniform duties as a supervisor. And uh, in 2006, I went overseas uh, in as a police, uh, police instructor for Iraqi police recruits. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my, my history. Uh, grew up in Montreal, youngest of four children. My mom was 44, my dad was 52 when I was born. I wasn't part of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> and I, unfortunately, uh, my, my father died uh, when I was nine months old, uh, leaving my mom with four kids to raise. So, you know, I'm not gonna get into a whole bunch of details about, about stuff, but I will tell you there was trauma from the age of seven, pretty much until I left home at 50. And, uh, and like many victims of, of trauma, I, uh, I picked a, a helping profession and joined the military. Um, I didn't, 
my my work related trauma much of it didn't really come from the military it came from um uniform related events i attended uh later on but when i came back from the middle east uh i was uh i was a mess uh i was uh, self-medicating i couldn't sleep my terrors like i would wake up feeling like a four-year-old boy um uh, flashbacks, uh, which for me manifested in uh, images of, of bodies I had dealt with over the years. And very disconcerting when a flashback comes because they don't announce themselves. They just, uh, they just arrive at the most inopportune moments. And, uh, you know, because of that, over time, I became very hypervigilant uh, because I wasn't sleeping well. I was... Uh, irritable, uh, I raged, um, and eventually um, ended up alone. I lost a marriage. I lost my, uh, my career opportunities. I lost family members, relationships, uh, money. I ended up living out of my truck for a little while, um, wondering how the heck I ended up like this. <laughs> and uh, so, <clears throat> It, uh, it culminated into one night where I just decided that uh, there's a line in the movie Shawshank Redemption, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. And, uh, you know, I had a couple of grandchildren and I remember my, uh, my psychologist saying, you can't model that for them. You know, and so that's hanging on to that. And I just said, okay, I'm going to get busy here. I'm going to throw myself into recovery. Uh, hard and get better and and i was um but the thing was now i was doing recovery sober and uh recovery from ptsd sober and i was really struggling with the night terrors uh dissociating uh isolating uh there were some days i didn't get out of bed i just stayed in the fetal position in a darkened room I wouldn't answer the door wouldn't answer the phone um and uh, somebody suggested to me, uh, I think they had seen a 60 minutes program on uh, service dogs. And they said, why don't, you, why don't you look into that? And I thought, okay, you know, so I started looking around. And, uh, as, as Danny has said, uh, the need is great and, and the resources are few. And uh, <laughs> this place I kept coming back to when I was researching was National Service Dogs but they weren't accepting any clients at the time. Uh, and this was long. I, I saw that, you know, out of all of them, uh, all of the places I looked at, NSD was the only one that was Assistance Dogs International certified. And that meant a lot to me. So I threw my application in many ways. And uh, geez, like a couple of months later, I actually, I got a phone call and uh, somebody came out and interviewed me. And, um, they said it would be two years, and true to their word, two years, almost two years to the day, you know, uh, I got vitus, and uh, whoa, wow. It wasn't easy in the beginning, I'm going to tell you that. Um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't prepared for having eyes on, you know, having people look at me. I wasn't prepared for people coming up and wanting to pet them. You know, I thought it was, but I, I, I really wasn't. And uh, that was just trial by fire, you know. And I, and I shared uh, uh, before with Danny, uh, I had an incident at a Zare store. And it was packed that day. And, and I, was, uh, I was anxious uh, to be in the store to begin with. And I ended up in line. And I'm next to go up to the cash. And there's this great big guy standing behind me. And he's got the look. I know, I just know he's going to ask me the question. And he says, uh, so uh, what kind of dog is that? I said, well, he's a yellow lab golden retriever cross. No, man, like, uh, what, what is he? Like, what do you need the dog for? And I looked at him and I said, with a very straight face into his eyes, he helps to control my homicidal impulses. And he, 
And he kind of goes, oh, sorry, sorry, you know. And I said, no, you know what? I'm sorry, look, you just asked me a very personal question and now everybody's ears are strained to hear why I'm here with this dog. And it's intrusive. And, and I'm just trying to educate you that don't ask, you know, it's, it's really none of your business. And uh, <laughs> so I have fun with it sometimes and sometimes not so much fun. In, uh, in 2016, I was invited to go out for breakfast by a friend into this uh, restaurant in Leamington. And uh, we sat down, um, it was very quiet. Uh, the waitress was, the server, she was awesome. She said, oh, I see you have a service dog. I can't engage with him. Oh, he's so cute though, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, takes our order. This guy walks in and uh, there's yelling. He starts yelling. I think he's a, an irate customer. And it turns out he's the son of the owner. And he starts berating me for having a dog at the restaurant. And, um, you know, I, I tried to remain calm with him. Hindsight being 2020, I didn't have my cell phone with me, which, you know, I encourage everybody with a service dog, always have your cell phone with you. But I didn't. And, um, you know, he ended, up, uh, he ended up standing over the table saying, what do you need a dog for? Were you blind? You can't walk? What's your problem? You know, and my friend that was with me, uh, <laughs> no, knowing my, my temperament, um, he said later, he said, well, I can't believe how well you contained yourself. And the only way I was able to contain myself in that moment was I was concerned for Vitus. And Vitus, my attention was on him, and I walked out, and I said something unkind to him, and uh, took him to a Human Rights Act tribunal. They found the guy guilty. Um, he was uh, fine restitution from my lawyer, issue a public apology. He did not a zero, nothing. And I found out Human Rights Act tribunals are only paper lines. They can make recommendations, but they can't enforce. So if I wanted to get my money back and all this, I would have had to take this guy to small claims court, who being the stand-up guy that he was, claimed bankruptcy. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it wasn't always easy, but I, I want to flash forward because I don't want to print up all the time here. I want to flash forward to how Vitus changed my life. He gave me, first of all, um, he gave me a reason to get up. I had to get up, I had to dress up, and I had to show up. I had to take him for his walks because by this point I was living alone and it was just me and him. And so you know, um, with PTSD, I wanted to isolate and not a good, good space to be in. So he would, he got me out. He got me out into nature. He got me out on the trails, you know. He, he taught me how to be uh, gentler. Vice is, uh, is an amazing dog. I call him Vice, a wonder dog. But he not only does things like night, night terror interruption. Uh, and nudging me if I dissociate or coming and giving me a visit when I'm kind of discombobulated. Like if I start getting angry, he looks at me, snorts and leaves the room. And that's my cue. Okay, whoa, whoa, you know, you're getting, you're getting angry. But it's like, he looks at me like, I'm having none of that. You know? And away he goes. He has changed my life so radically. You know, he started off uh, we had a tentative relationship. He became my wheelchair. And now I like to think of him as my walker. Because of COVID, uh, because of a lot of circumstances, because I'm getting better, hard to believe. I don't have to rely on Vitus as much as I had to in the past. I still need him, believe me. I still have my days when I turn on the news <laughs> or whatever and I start going down the rabbit hole. Um, but I, I, he's given me a life. He's given me a quality of life that um, no drugs, no therapy could do for me. You know, my, my psychologist couldn't nudge me awake at two in the morning when the terrorists came, you know. So I don't know if that, if that gives any of you any inspiration to carry on and do what you're doing, but please do, please do, because, wow, you are so needed. And with that, I've talked long enough. 
I'll turn it over to the Christensen Center. Thanks. Thank you, Jim, for sharing your story. Um, I I think I speak for all of us when I say that the the tears were right on the edge there. That was really touching. Thanks for being so open with us. Um, Denny, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for your advocacy as well. Like I said earlier, in light of what's gone on in Kitchener with that young man with uh, with autism, with his denial of access, as Jim pointed out, that situation was several years ago for him. And we still have so much work to do on that front. And everybody on this call is an ambassador for accessibility and helping to um, educate people so that what happened to Jim, what happened to that young man in Kitchener last week is, doesn't happen again. I mean, we as a society should be so far past that, but clearly we're not. And, and I wanna thank Jim for um, advocating so strongly and following it through, because that's the harder road, right? Is to follow it through, so thank you. Right. Okay, uh, we're gonna pass the floor over to Lawrence and Andrea with NSD Links, and uh, they can share their story with us. Take the floor, guys. Well, hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to say what Jim said, ditto. So <laughs> thanks for listening. Uh, I, I'm just kidding to a point. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a struggle some days for me. And uh, I, I'm going to quickly, I, I got a little humor here on the incident that happened in Kitchener is I, I invited some army friends uh, several of them using dogs to go out for a beer and see if they wanted to manhandle us like they manhandled that young man. And uh, I had so many offers that, to meet you there. And, uh, but that would just perpetuate the, the problem. It wouldn't solve it. It's funny to think about, but uh, I've been in the incident where I've been denied access um, on Remembrance Day uh, at a, a casino that was offering veterans a free meal. And uh, they told me I couldn't come in with my dog and we escalated it. Danny got involved. Um, and I think there was some education done there too. Um, so- Yeah, I I'd forgotten about that one, Lawrence. And yeah, we reached out and directly talked to the casino owners and they were very, um, apologetic but uh yeah i'd forgotten about that one that was a couple of years ago yes it was yeah um anyways that's i don't think why we're here um i i want to thank nsd uh for because <laughs> i won't apologize for it either jim i get emotional this is so important to me um they they gave me my life back with 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 NSD links and you volunteers are angels. Um, um, there, my my hero is the young woman that spent 18 months puppy raising links, and I'm still in contact with her. I still call her my hero because um, I don't know if I could have done that and given up a dog that I spent that time with. Um, so. My, my history is uh, military. Uh, I'm a 28 year veteran. Um, I spent out of that 28 years, uh, 84 months uh, outside of this country. Um, I did uh, several trips to the Middle East on peacekeeping missions. Um, I spent time in Africa. Um, again, peacekeeping and humanitarian aid distribution. Um, I was in Cambodia clearing mines. Um, I was a teenager when I left and my first injury occurred before my 20th birthday. Um, and the solution to that at the time over when we got back to camp was that was a really rough one. Why don't you guys go and uh, we've opened up the bar so you can have some drinks. 
that was the solution the military gave us back then. Um, it's since changed, and I'm glad it has. Uh, the recognition of the the um, the trauma injuries in the military. Um, it's not where maybe it should be. There's still some stigma involved. Um, but at the time when I finally reached out, the stigma didn't matter anymore. Um, my, my mental health, my physical health is affected directly from my mental health. Um, so uh, my last um, trauma, I'll say, was in 2004, and uh, there was no involvement with an armed enemy. There was no, um, I, was, I was in a very safe location overseas, but all the work up to it and the being deployed sent me over the edge. Um, and I came back <laughs> an absolute mess. I remember one day leaving the house in the morning and I hear Andy trying to get, Craig was maybe three or four, my son, who's now 20. Um, and he wouldn't, he didn't want to wear a shirt that she, Andy wanted to wear. She's trying to get out of the house. Um, so I'd storm in, um, my boots are on, I'm ready to go out the door and go to work. And I storm in and I'm yelling at him and cursing him up <laughs> it still it still gets me and so I'm storming out and I'm going down the stairs we live in a, a raised ranch and there was a couch along the the one banister and he runs out <laughs> holy God. it's okay it's okay he runs out and he's on the back that on the couch looking over at me telling me how sorry he is you know, um, so it's not just me that's affected. It was my whole family. And then fast forward to, I get medically released from the military. We have, uh, we've, we've rescued a dog, um, a Newfie dog. And uh, she is so instrumental in keeping me focused and not going into a terrible depression, I, I say. And uh, my psychologist realizes this and uh, she, had, uh, she had watched uh, a man named Medrick do uh, a march to Ottawa. He's from Nova Scotia. And uh, so she, she introduced me on the internet to this man and I watched him for a while doing his walk. He walked from Nova Scotia to Ottawa. And uh, she said, so have you been paying attention to Medrick, Medrick Cousineau? And I said, yeah, I have. She said, what do you think? <laughs> you think that might help you? And I, yeah, I, I think it might. And I did the same thing Jim did. I started researching and I kept going back to national service dogs. Um, there were so many places out there that were willing to sell me a dog, willing to train my dog um, for upwards of $25,000. Um, I, I actually, uh, I know a gentleman who fell into that trap and, and spent $25,000 of Veterans Affairs money and ended up with a dog that was so reactive and it was not a fit for him. And it was his dog they had trained. Um, and the happy ending to that story is he's got uh, an ADI uh, accredited trained service dog from uh, a trainer in Petawawa, I believe. Danny would know the name. I don't, it, it, it matters not. He's got a dog that doesn't cost him a trip to Petawawa and some food and vet bills. So it's, that really sold me. And then I realized that every year NSD was gonna come and certify my dog to be a public 
access dog. And I never, I, I still don't own them. The National Service dogs own them. So what kind of um, commitment do they have to that dog changing my life that they're going to do all that? None of the other places were doing that. They were all just take my money, take my money. Um, and at the time, I didn't have the money. I hadn't done any Veterans Affairs stuff. I was so, you know. Um, another struggle I had getting the service dog, and I was, again, I'm going to mirror Jim here. It's, it's, we, we sound so much the same. I, about six months before I was going to be placed with Lynx, I realized that I could hide no longer as someone struggling with PTSD. Um, that I was going to be walking down the street with a dog that had a vest on that was a service dog. And, and I, I had to work hard with my psychologist to, to, to deal with that. Um, I, I think I'm at a place these days that I, it doesn't matter because I know what he does for me and I know he helps me get out. Um, speaking of which, it's funny because, uh, Rochelle, I think you asked us a question um, whether I still needed my dog. Um, and it wasn't maybe a month or two ago. Uh, we needed some garbage tags. Here in Trenton, we have to put tags on our garbage to have it picked up. So you got to go to the store to buy them. And Craig was working on schoolwork. He's been doing university from the, the campus in our basement. And... Uh, so I said, I'm just going to go down to the store. I'll get some tags. I'll just run in. He's like, going to take links. I said, no, no, I think it'll be fine. I think it'll be fine. Uh, about probably 45, between 45 minutes and an hour later, I got home. No garbage tags. And my son is like, dad, are you okay? I said, he said, where have you been? <laughs> I said, I've been sitting outside the store trying to go into the store. So I said, no, he you know what, I, I still need them. Um, Lynx wakes me up from nightmares. Um, that was a full-time job for him when he first come to live with me. Um, and I, I, I use the analogy today that there is, uh, there's a, when I go to sleep, there's a little guy that runs a projector in my, in my head that sets up for my dreams. And uh, he pulls out the, the film today um, and he goes, oh, maybe I should do this one tonight. And, and his, his partner says, don't bother because that stupid dog's just going to wake him up. We won't even get halfway through the reel. <laughs> and uh, because he does, he, he still wakes me up when I'm, when I'm struggling. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been so life-changing. I remember... The first weekend I came home after our, our training, our team training, and uh, see this stuff really, it, it makes me emotional. All my son wanted to do was go to a movie. Just go to the theater and see a movie with his dad. And he was probably what, 12? 13 we had we'd never made it yeah, through the first so. couple of minutes of a movie when we tried because i had to leave because there was too much danger in that movie theater and uh you know but i got we got there and i said okay and i i sat down in the theater and i was okay and Lynx was right there his head was on my lap and then he was on the floor and then where the lights start going down and i start this i'm scanning the crowd and looking for the dangers and watching the door and looking for ways out. And all of a sudden I got, I, I got this furry head in my lap and, and it's, it's not that he's magical, but he brings me back to the moment to right now to present. And, and then I can, I can use the other tools that I've got to calm myself and my grounding techniques and, and, and I can come back to the here and now. And we lasted that whole movie. I don't even know what movie it was. All I remember is sitting beside my son where I should be at a movie theater, like, like any dad should. Um, 
I don't even know where I'm at now. Uh, yeah. Well, may, um, I mean, so, I mean, maybe Andy, you know, do you mind sharing what it's, you know, from, from a significant other side of the equation? I mean, you guys, you guys are an awesome team. Like I think of your whole family as a, a team, but I've gotten to know you over the years. Um, I've had, um, you guys don't know, 2019, Lawrence represented Team Canada at the Warrior Games in Tampa. And I had the good fortune to mm -hmm. kind of uh, tag along on their vacation and to watch Team Canada compete. And Lawrence represented really well. And, and this family, I can, it's just, just a nice cohesive team unit. And between the dogs and the people, you guys come together really well, but do you have a, do you have any perspective on that, Andy, to share? Um, yeah, I think, um, it, you know, I can sort of speak to a lot of the things that he, he, he shares about, um, like first saying there's, there's not a chance that warrior games ever would have happened for him. Like with the, without links, it just you know wouldn't happen. But you know when he talks about the the disassociation that that he would experience, um, and I've seen that disassociation happen. I have been with him in moments where whatever's going on, and I may not understand what exactly it is, but I've been watching him long enough to know the instant that he's left the room. And he and like he's still physically standing next to me, but that's it. The rest of him is somewhere else, and I have no idea where it is. And I've been with him when that happens. Um, and I, well, it hasn't happened since 2015, the, to my knowledge, because I've not I've not seen it happen since Links came into his life. Wow. Um, I mean. I'm sure it probably has at times, but certainly not, not to the degree that I've seen it. Um, I think overall, I mean, it's just, it's, it's given him his life back, but it's given our family a life again, because before Lynx, I used to have to go watch a lot of superhero movies, which I don't like but I did. So I'm happy to say that since 2015, I've not had to go watch a single Star Wars or Marvel or <laughs> Justice League movie. So I'm good with that. But it's more the, I think the most heartbreaking thing always was, was it was always me and Craig going and doing things and things that I so wanted Lawrence to be a part of. And I know he wanted to be a part of. And it was that, you know, us going off and doing the, you know, the concerts or the amusement park or the festivals. And then just coming back and the best that we could do was share with him and, and say, you know, this is how great it was. But feeling really quite heartbroken for him that he couldn't be a part of that. And and it 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 really it doesn't seem like much and yet it does seem like so much and i just i so wanted him to be able to be a part of those things and so in i think it was 2014 we had been promising for years that we were going to take craig to disney and um so we did uh that was pre-links so it, it was pretty much done in a constant fog of Ativan that I would, you know, because it was, it was not just that added sort of stress of sort of trying to keep Lawrence calm in, in what could be a potentially volatile situation at any turn, but it was also that I didn't just have responsibility for him, I had responsibility for Craig, and I didn't want Craig's Disney experience to be affected by something that we didn't necessarily have any control over. So, so I was, I was the keeper of the Ativan for that trip. And as I felt he needed it, he would, and, and I'm sure there's probably only about 50% of the trip he even remembers because it was just trying mm -hmm. to keep him at a, at a stable level 
so that Craig could have a good time and that Lawrence could be a part of something that was so important. So it's uh, bringing links into it. I mean, they go do stuff all the time now and together. And I mean, even something as simple as grocery shopping that Lawrence now does all the grocery shopping. And that that's huge for somebody who, who could never do it before, who always just felt like, well, I can't do that. So my wife has to do it or my son has to do it. But now he's got links and he goes off and does it or he goes off and he does things that so many people take for granted that you know he couldn't do otherwise so yeah it, 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 so it's not just changed his life it's changed our life as a family because now we can do things as a family and not not have mm -hmm. to worry that you know it's gonna send him over the edge or or kind of do a number on him and he's going to have to spend the next two weeks recovering from something. So. Yeah. Well, and I didn't, I'd never heard the Disney story before and listening to you and then thinking back to my experience in Florida with you guys at the warrior games and uh, what the, everybody listening doesn't know is um, some very nice supporter down there um, rented out. Was it the state, the hockey arena in Tampa? Yeah. Yeah, and the, we were there for Canada Day and they, they did a huge Canada Day celebrations inside the arena. It was packed with hundreds, thousands yeah. of people, um, yeah. all expat Canadians living in Tampa. And then all the athletes were invited in. And to see you guys in the context of the Disney, the Disney experience mm -hmm. to that Tampa experience would have been night and day. Oh, yeah in that yeah. environment and you guys and the dog just, we had a great time that night and enjoyed food, drink and all the great stuff that was going on with Team Canada. So, um, yeah. That's I'm gonna pretty... interrupt. What's that? Um, I'm gonna interrupt you. I know I'm not supposed to because you're the grand <laughs> no, <that's... football. laughs> <No>. <laughs> But that, that swimming event that I did, um, and I don't know if you noticed it, but if Lynx wasn't with me, I would never have got very far into that pool deck to even line up to to stage or anything. And I, I've I've looked at the pictures and I've looked at some video of me, and Lynx is so focused on me mm -hmm. that day because I was so anxious. I I mean, I, I my first event was a freestyle swim and I totally missed the, the start because I didn't I didn't hear it. I, I, I left my platform because the guy beside me as was diving in. Um, so yeah. and then I go to my my breaststroke and I, I took seven or nine seconds off my personal best time on a 50 meter swim, one length of the pool, that's huge. Yeah. But, and, and they were so like, I never had any issue, like Lynx was on the pool deck. And then yeah. one of our coaches handled them around to the other end of the, the pool. So when I get out, Lynx was there. It was just, yeah. it was yeah. so, it was, I it was amazing to, to set a picture for everybody. Um, the dog, as, as Lauren said, his coach was holding on to Lynx at the starting block. And then once you were getting set up, he walked the dog to the end of the pool so that Lawrence could go right and swim right down to the dog. And um, yeah, you guys rocked it that day, but the entire community there was incredibly um, supportive. And um, it was just, it was, for me, I'll never forget that experience watching Team Canada. We had two dogs, I believe, on Team Canada, yeah. Lynx and um, Pr Princess. Leah. And, and those dogs, and even Lynx, was um, responding to other veterans who were struggling. And Lawrence shared them a couple of times over the course <laughs> of the time that I was there. Um, and it was really special to watch how the dog interacted even with people who weren't his people and provided some, some support when allowed. 
And uh, I'm just really grateful for you guys for being advocates for our program, for being open to the experience and for um, just taking the opportunity and just running with it in so many ways. I mean, we haven't even talked about, you know, going out west with the dog all by yourself to do that equine program and cowboying up for a week, just you and Lynx. So um, kudos to you guys for taking every opportunity you've been given and running with it. We really appreciate it. Well, kudos to NSD, because without it, I, I wouldn't do, have done any of that, so. Well, we're happy, we're happy to have helped both of you, all of you guys, Jim, Lawrence, Craig, Andrea, like uh, it's, it's been great to watch you guys thrive and that's what we do it for. And we're just super grateful and grateful that you, as difficult as it is to share sometimes, um, it does inspire our team and um, our, our volunteers and our stakeholders to understand, to educate and to um, keep going because you're not wrong. Those puppies are, are pretty damn cute. And uh, knowing where they're going and how important the work they're gonna do is, is, is what motivates people to be able to hand that leash over. So thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you guys for sharing your story. Uh, both stories are equally incredible and uh, it definitely touches all of us here. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers? You, you're welcome to pop yourself off mute if you do or put it in the chat box. I don't have a question, but I do want to say thank you to the, the gentleman for uh, agreeing to speak with us. It, uh, it's inspiring and it feel, makes me feel uh, good about the future of the possible future for um, the dog that I'm helping to uh, raise. Hmm. Oh, thank you. You have thank no idea. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea, Jim said. We have, we have been ever grateful for, since our very first day at National Service Dogs for everybody who, who works for NSD and more importantly, volunteers for NSD because it just, you know, the lives you change, it's just absolutely mind blowing. It really is. And, and, and because of the volunteers, I mean, we have a family that I can pretty much guarantee we wouldn't have today, if not for the people who volunteered for NSD, who raised links and, and who raised money at an egg hunt and stuff like that. It just, we, we <laughs> never be able to say thank you enough. For me, I, I, uh, I think we have to work harder uh, lobbying our government um, to standardize and, and uh, to issue identification and to stop allowing people to muddle the waters with, uh, you know, purchased online service dog vests for their little Fifi so they can go and eat in a restaurant and it's wrong and, and it has to change. Um, to me, it's no different than parking in a handicapable spot when you don't need to be in there. And the government has to step up um, and regulate and, and, and talk to national service dogs and say, okay, what is the standard? And, and, and now we'll issue this, this client with, a, with identification that says they are entitled to have the service dog, they have a bona fide need, and that just, that would, you know, I don't blame some of these restaurant owners, I'll be honest with you, like not this particular guy with the autism, but I mean, I, I've heard horror stories of people bringing dogs in, saying it's a service dog, and the dog's barking all over the place and, you know, sniffing people's crotches, and, and it's just wrong. And that's what yeah. I would want to get across to the public. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Jim. And, and for those on the call, I mean, NSD has been front and center trying to advocate for that type of legislation uh, for a very long time. And um, we're committed to, to continuing to um, push that agenda as best we can to try and get um, meaningful legislation here in Ontario specifically.